Well, looks like it's time for some more Pauline action. Uh, as we go on, you may, like me, uh, kind of uh, find yourself puzzled that uh, so much of this parallels the canonical acts, but not exactly, not that closely. So the author presumably knew the canonical acts, so what's the point of this? Well, I guess to fill in more stuff uh, that he thought happened or might have happened? Uh, I don't know, but uh, when we uh, get to the section we're up to today, uh, uh, numbered in my uh, edition uh, nine, uh, from Philippi to Corinth, uh, we, this sounds kind of like uh, Ephesians 19 to me, uh, or 20, I guess it is, the farewell speech. Anyway, let's read it and see what we, uh, what we make of it. When Paul came from Philippi to Corinth to the house of Epiph Epiphanius, I think that's how you say it, maybe Epiphanius, take your pick. There was joy. All our people rejoiced, but at the same time wept, as Paul related what he had suffered in Philippi and the workhouse and everywhere and what had befallen him, so that his tears became copious, I guess, something missing. And prayer was offered without ceasing by all for Paul. And he counted himself blessed that so single-heartedly every day they guided his affairs in prayers, prayer to the Lord. Unrivaled, therefore, was the greatness of the joy, and Paul's soul was uplifted because of the good will of the brethren, so that for forty days he preached the word of perseverance, namely, in what place anything had befallen him and what great deeds had been granted him. So his own little recounting of what happened to him was in effect preaching the, um, the ideal of perseverance since he was the big illustration of it. Right? Um, so in every account he praised Almighty God and Christ Jesus, who in every place had been well pleased with Paul. But when the days were ended and the time drew near for Paul to depart for Rome, grief came upon the brethren as to when they should see him again. And Paul, full of the Holy Spirit, said, Brethren, be zealous about the work of the Lord, missing text, uh, and love. For behold, I go away to a furnace of fire. Youch! And I am not strong except the Lord grant me power. For indeed David accompanied Saul, uh, and one, I guess, a missing text, for Christ Jesus was with him. Missing text. The grace of the Lord will go with me that I may fulfill the uh, blank dispensation you know, the, the administration of the tasks uh, um, he's given me with steadfastness. But they were distressed and fasted. Then Cleobius was filled with the spirit and said, Brethren, now must Paul fulfill his assignment and go up to the blank of death. Um, blank in great instruction and knowledge and sowing of the word and must suffer envy and depart out of this world. But when the brethren and Paul heard this, they lifted up their voice and said, Oh God, uh, missing text, Father of Christ, help Paul your servant that he may yet abide with us because of our weakness. But since Paul was cut to the heart and no longer fasted uh, with them, when an offering was celebrated by Paul, we don't know what happened because uh, somebody's rubbed out the text or something. But the spirit came upon Myrta so that she said, Brethren, why are you alarmed at the sight of this sign? Oh, something big happened. Uh, Paul, the servant of the Lord, will save many in Rome and will nourish innumerable people with the word, and he will become manifest above all the faithful and greatly will the glory um, 
come upon him so that there will be great grace in Rome. And immediately when the spirit that was in uh, Myrta was at peace, each one partook of the bread and uh, feasted according to custom. Uh, blank, uh, amid the singing of psalms of David and of hymns. And Paul, too, was glad. On the following day, after they had spent the whole night according to the will of God, Paul said, Brethren, I shall set out on Friday and sail for Rome, that I may not delay what is commanded and laid upon me, for to this I was appointed. They were greatly distressed when they heard this, and all the brethren contributed according to their ability so that Paul might not be troubled, except that he was going away from the brethren. That, that would not be his only regret. He now has the, uh, the, the money to buy the ticket. Now, does all this follow uh, the sequence of uh, hearings before Felix and Festus and Agrippa and all this? Uh, is he going right to Rome on his own initiative? Uh, it's, uh, it's oddly different from Acts in this respect. I mean, the same thing is ultimately happening as if the writer had heard some vague summary. Well, Paul wound up in Rome where he was killed and so forth. But uh, that's it. He apparently didn't know the details. That would imply uh, the canonical acts had not been written or were not yet widely known. Who knows? Uh, section 10, from Corinth to Italy. As he embarked on the ship while they all prayed, uh, Artemon, the captain of the ship, was there. He had been baptized by Peter and, missing text, Paul, that so much was entrusted to him, blank, that the Lord was embarking, trusted to him by both, oh, who knows. But when the ship had set sail, Artemon came together with Paul to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in the grace of God, since he had foreordained his plan for Paul. When they were on the open sea and it was uh, quiet, Paul fell asleep fatigued by the fastings and the uh, the night watches with the brethren. And the Lord came to him walking upon the sea. Whoa, what do you know? Jesus is back for a stroll on the, on the blue. And he touched Paul and said, stand up and see. And he awoke and said, you are my Lord, Jesus Christ, the King. But why are you so gloomy and downcast, Lord? And if you, missing text, Lord, for I am not a little distressed that you are so. Huh. And the Lord said, Paul, I am about to be crucified afresh. And Paul said, God forbid, Lord, that I should see this. But the Lord said to Paul, Paul, uh, Paul, get up, go to Rome, and admonish the brethren that they abide in the calling to the Father. And walking on the sea, he went on before them and showed the way. Now, does this remind you of anything? It's like the Quo Vadis scene with Peter in a, his apocryphal acts, where the brethren have persuaded him, look, don't. Uh, deprive us of, of you. Uh, uh, get out of town while you can because they're gunning for you. We don't want to lose you for good. Look, I'm not afraid of being crucified. He says, yeah, but we don't want you to be bereft of you. Goes, okay. And so he uh, is sneaking out of Jerusalem on the Appian Way. And who does he run into but Jesus, what, what the heck are you doing here? And he says, well, you see, I have to go to Rome to be crucified again. What? Why? And he says, well, somebody was supposed to be crucified, but he's chickening out. So I guess I'm going to have to do it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, okay, well, see ya. And he turns around and goes back to Rome. This is the same sort of thing, right? The, those Peter and Paul uh, uh, correspondences, like in the canonical acts, the same sort of thing here. Uh, okay. Paul went with great sadness. Uh, when the voyage was ended, Paul went with great sadness, and he saw a man standing on the harbor who was waiting for Artemon, the captain, and when Artemon saw him, he greeted him. And he said to him, Claudius, 
see here Paul, the beloved of the Lord, who is with me. Claudius embraced Paul and greeted him. And without delay, he and Artemon carried the baggage from the ship to his house. And he rejoiced greatly and informed the brethren about him, so that at once Claudius's house was filled with joy and thanksgiving. For they saw how Paul laid aside his mood of sadness and taught the word of truth and said, Brethren and soldiers of Christ, listen. Uh, how often did God deliver Israel out of the hand of the lawless? And as long as they kept the things of God, he did not forsake them. For he saved them out of the hand of Pharaoh and the lawless and of Og, one of the giants left in Canaan, um, a more ungodly king, and of Adar and the foreign people. And as long as they kept the things of God, he gave them the fruit of the loins after he had promised them the land of the Canaanites, and he made the foreign people subject to them. And after all the things that he had provided for them in the desert and in the waterless country, he sent them in addition prophets to, to uh, uh, proclaim our Lord Jesus Christ. And these in succession received a share and a portion of the spirit of Christ and having suffered greatly were slain by the people, the prophets. Having thus forsaken the living God according to their own desires, they forfeited the eternal inheritance. And now, brethren, a great temptation lies before us. If we endure, we shall have access to the Lord and shall receive as the refuge and shield of his good pleasure, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, if at least you receive the word as it is. For in these last times, God for our sakes has sent down a spirit of power into the flesh, that is, into Mary the Galilean, according to the prophetic word, which was conceived and born by her as the fruit of her womb until she was delivered and gave birth to Jesus the Christ, our king of Bethlehem and Judea, brought up in Nazareth, who went to Jerusalem and taught all Judea, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Forsake the darkness, receive the light, you who live in the darkness of death. A light has arisen for you. And you'll recognize that from Matthew. And he did great and wonderful works, choosing from the tribes 12 men whom he had with him in understanding and faith and ignorance and cowardice, you might add, if you were reading Mark. Um, okay. Uh, as he raised the dead, healed diseases, cleansed lepers, healed the blind, made cripples whole, raised up paralytics, cleansed those possessed by demons, etc., etc. But somebody has mercifully omitted the rest of the, the text of that passage. Uh, okay, then it picks up somewhere. Uh, they wondered greatly and deliberated in their hearts. He said to them, why are you amazed? Oh, okay, wait a minute. Okay, he's doing miracles now. Uh, um, or is he... Uh, is he uh, quoting Jesus here? Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Uh, the people seeing Jesus do miracles, probably it said, wondered greatly and deliberated in their hearts. He said to them, why are you amazed that I raise up the dead or that I make the lame walk or that I cleanse the lepers or that I raise up the sick or that I've healed the paralytic and those possessed by demons or that I've divided a little bread and satisfied many or that I've walked upon the sea or that I've commanded the winds. If you believe this and are convinced, then are you great. For truly I say to you, if you say to this mountain, be moved and cast into the sea and are not doubtful in your heart, it will happen for you. When one of them was convinced whose name was Simon and who said, uh, Lord, uh, truly great are the works which you do. For we have never heard nor have we ever seen the man who has raised the dead except you. The Lord said to him, um, you will... 
Pray for the works which I myself will do, but the other works I will do at once. For these I do for the sake of a temporary deliverance in the time during which they're in these places, that they may believe in him who sent me. Holy mackerel, are you speaking in tongues or is that just bad writing? Um, Simon said to him, Lord, command me to speak. And he said to him, speak, Peter. Uh, before from that day he called them by name he said what then is the work that is greater than these except the raising of the dead and the feeding of such a crowd the lord said to him there's something that is greater than this and blessed are they who have believed with all their heart but philip lifted up lifted up his voice in wrath saying uh, what manner of thing is this that you will teach us but he said to him you and then we're missing stuff again. Okay, now we uh, jump to what this was pointing to uh, at whatever distance, uh, the martyrdom of uh, good old Paul. You knew it was coming, right? Luke, who had come from Gaul, and Titus, who had come from Dalmatia, I expected Paul at Rome. When Paul saw them, he rejoiced and rented a barn outside Rome where he and the brethren taught the word of truth. He became famous and many souls were added to the Lord so that it was noised about in Rome and a great many from the house of the emperor came to him and there was much joy. You see, this is very different from the canonical acts. He's just going there. I mean, he does as in the canonical acts, uh, know that he, he's going to meet his end there, at least in the previous section he did. But here he's just going to have a, an evangelistic crusade. Hallelujah. If you came on a bus, they'll wait on you. Uh, let's see here. Um, a certain Patroclus, a cup bearer of the emperor, who had come too late to the barn and could not get near to Paul on account of the throng of the people, sat on a high window and listened as he taught the word of God. But Satan, being wicked, became jealous of the love of the brethren, and Patroclus fell down from the window and died. What? Isn't this Eutychus? Well, it looks like it's another version of it or a ripoff of it. Don't know which. Uh, okay. Uh, speedily, it was reported to Nero. Uh, Paul, however, having learned it by the Spirit, said, Brethren, the evil one has obtained a way to tempt you. Go forth and you will find the boy who has fallen down and is dying. Lift him up and bring him here. This they did. Uh, when the people saw him, they were frightened. Paul said to them, Now, brethren, show your faith. Come, let us mourn to the Lord, to our Lord Jesus Christ, that the boy might live and we remain unharmed. Right? They're going to say, Oh, you killed this guy uh, somehow? Uh, manslaughter, at least. Says, no, no, we, we can't afford that. Uh, let's, let's raise the kid up so we don't get in trouble. Okay. Um, uh, when all began to lament, the boy took breath, and having put him on an animal, they sent him away alive with all those who were of the emperor's house. You see? You see? Uh, if, it come, if you tell the emperor what happened, he won't be hostile toward us. He'll say, hey, that Paul is something else. Two, and Nero, having heard of Patroclus's death, became very sad. As he came out from his bath, he ordered another to be appointed for the wine to serve it. Right? He, he got the immediate news that poor Patroclus had fallen to his death, and he doesn't know about the, uh, the resurrection or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but his servant said, Emperor, Patroclus is alive and stands at the sideboard. When the emperor heard that Patroclus was alive, he was frightened and would not come in. Sure, it's not a ghost. But when he came in and saw Patroclus, he cried out, Patroclus, are you alive? He answered, I am alive, Caesar. But he said, who is he who made you live? And the boy, uplifted by the confidence of faith, said, Christ Jesus, the king of the ages. The emperor asked in dismay, is he to be king of the ages and destroy all kingdoms? Patroclus said to him, yes, he destroys all kingdoms. 
kingdoms under heaven, and he alone shall remain in all eternity, and there will be no kingdom which escapes him. And he struck his face, Nero slapped him, that is, and cried out, Patroclus, are you also fighting for that king? Uh, he answered, yes, my Lord and Caesar, for he has raised me from the dead. <laughs> what do you expect? <laughs> um, not every day you get resurrected. Okay? Uh, and Barsabbas Justice, the flat-footed, I do like a nickname like that. And Uriah, the Cappadocian, and Festus of Galatia, the chief men of Nero, said, uh, and we too fight for him, the king of the ages. After having tortured those men whom he used to love, he imprisoned them and ordered that the soldiers of the great king be sought and he issued an edict that all Christians and soldiers of Christ that were found should be executed. Oh boy, this guy's in a bad mood. Three, and among the many, Paul also was brought in fetters. Those who were imprisoned with him looked at him so that the emperor observed that he was the leader of the soldiers. And he, oh, as he describes him, the adherents of this new king, Jesus. And he said to him, man of the great king, now my prisoner, what induced you to come secretly into the Roman Empire and to enlist soldiers in my territory? But Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, said in the presence of all, Caesar, uh, we enlist soldiers uh, not only in your territory, but in all lands of the earth. For thus we are commanded to exclude none who wishes to fight for my king. Like he ought to lay off this metaphor, right? It's getting him in deeper and deeper trouble. Um, if it seems good to you, serve him, for neither riches nor the splendors of this life will save you. But if you become his subject and beseech him, you shall be saved. For in one day he will destroy the world. Having heard this, Nero commanded all the prisoners to be burned with fire, but Paul to be beheaded according to the law of the Romans. Because he's a citizen officially, right? And uh, they can't be uh, treated this way the others will be. He has to have a quick and easy death, uh, the old close shave approach. But Paul was not silent and communicated the word to Longus, the prefect, and uh, Cestus, the centurion. And Nero, being instigated by the evil one, raged in Rome and had many Christians executed without trial, so that the Romans stood before the palace and cried, It is enough, Caesar! These men are ours! You destroyed the strength of the Romans! Being thus convinced, he desisted and commanded that no Christian was to be touched till his case had been investigated. Uh, okay, for after the issuing of the edict, Paul was brought before him, and he insisted that he should be executed. And Paul said, Caesar, I live not merely for a short time for my king, and if you have me executed, I shall do the following. I will rise again and appear to you, for I shall not be dead, but alive to my king, Christ Jesus, who shall come to judge the earth. And Longus and Cestus said to Paul, Whence have you this king that you believe in him without changing your mind even at point of death? And Paul answered and said, You men who are now ignorant and in error, change your mind and be saved from the fire which comes over the whole earth. It's about to. I, for we fight not as you suppose, for a king who is from the earth, but for one who is from heaven. He is the living God who comes as judge because of the lawless deeds which take place in this world. And blessed is he who will believe in him and live in eternity when he shall come with fire to purge the earth. And they besought him and said, We entreat you, help us, and we will release you. But he answered, I'm not a deserter from Christ, but a faithful soldier of the living God. If I knew that I should die, I would still have done it. 
uh, longus and cestus, but since I live to God and love myself, I go to the Lord that I may come again with him in the glory of his father. And they said to him, how can we live after you have been beheaded? And while they were speaking, Nero sent a certain Parthenius and uh, Feritas to see whether Paul had already been beheaded, and they found him still alive. He summoned them beside him and said, Believe in the living God who will raise me as well as all those who believe in him from the dead. But they said, We will now go to Nero, but when you have died and have been raised up, we will believe in your God. But when Longus and Cestus continued to ask about salvation, he said to them, In the early dawn, come quickly to my grave, and you will find two men at prayer. Titus and Luke, they will give you the seal in the Lord baptism. And turning toward the east, Paul lifted up his hands to heaven and prayed at length. And after having conversed in Hebrew with the fathers during prayer, uh, what does that mean? Is he praying to uh, the, the dear departed in heaven, the patriarchs? He bent his neck without speaking any more. When the executioner cut off his head, milk splashed on the tunic of the soldier. And the soldier and all who stood nearby were astonished at this sight and glorified God who had thus honored Paul. And they went away and reported everything to Caesar. When he heard of it, he was amazed and did not know what to say. While many philosophers and the centurion uh, were assembled with the emperor, Paul came about the ninth hour, and in the presence of all, he said, Caesar, behold, here is Paul, the soldier of God. I am not dead, but live in my God. But upon you, unhappy one, many evils and great punishment will come, because you have unjustly shed the blood of the righteous not many days ago. And having spoken this, Paul departed from him. When Nero had heard, he commanded that the prisoners be released, Patroclus, as well as Barsabbas with his friends. And as Paul had told them, Longus and Cestus, the centurion, came in fear very early to the grave of, of Paul. And when they drew near, they found two men in prayer and Paul with them, and they became frightened when they saw the unexpected miracle. But Titus and Luke, being afraid at the sight of Longus and Cestus, turned to run away. But they followed and said to them, We follow you not in order to kill you, blessed men of God, as you imagine, but in order to live, that you may do us as Paul promised us. We have just seen him in prayer beside you. Upon hearing this, Titus and Luke gave them joyfully the seal and the Lord baptized them. Uh, glorifying God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul rose from the dead and appeared to Nero. Uh, when his head was chopped off, no blood came out, but only milk. And uh, his two uh, lieutenants, Luke and Titus, are there praying, and apparently they don't see him. But uh, the two Romans who were eager to be baptized do see him. And uh, so this is yet another resurrection uh, appearance. Uh, so again, it's so different from uh, the canonical acts. Is it supposed to replace it? Uh, was it written in ignorance of the canonical acts? Was it written earlier? Nobody really uh, can say, unfortunately. And, of course, it's fragmentary. I mean, there is, uh, you know, quite a bit of it in there. Um, I guess the, the most obvious um, uh, omission is the uh, baptism of the lion by Paul, but even there it's, it's mentioned again in the summary later. Uh, and so you've got various episodes where Paul is preaching and healing, uh, kind of typical by now, but I guess the biggies are uh, 
his uh, being saved in the uh, arena because of the Androcles episode that preceded it, where the, he uh, he bap he has baptized this Christian lion who therefore won't uh, attack him. Uh, this is kind of a doublet of the Paul and Thecla story, right? Where um, Thecla is thrown to the lions, but the uh, lady lion w won't attack her, but defends her. Seems like another retelling, like they couldn't remember which one of the uh, Christians uh, was aided by the lion. And so it was told in two divergent uh, versions. And then there's the um, third Corinthians and what led up to it. And uh, there's the, uh, the martyrdom of Paul himself. Uh, so it's uh, all uh, interesting stuff. It doesn't even necessarily follow that all of it was originally part of a long acts of Paul. Who knows? Right there. Uh, it's just that these, you know, they're not really incompatible completely, so it's possible they're part of a long, long thing, which is how we treated them. But it's interesting to know that uh, there were um, Gospels of the Apostles. And I mentioned that a while back, saying that it seems to me that uh, there's reason to think that, you know, when it says in First Corinthians, uh, my brethren, I hear there are factions among you, dissension among you, and I guess I believe it because I hear one of one person will say, I belong to Paul, another, I belong to Cephas, another, uh, I'm in the Apollos fan club, another, I belong to Christ. What? Does that mean Christ is on a par with these others? That... Um, and that they, the others were understood to be saviors or avatars or something like Jesus was. I mean, that's the way it was with the uh, the Mandeans, right? They believed John the Baptist was the true Messiah, not Jesus. So, and what happened with him? Well, he eventually got uh, assimilated into the Christian story when a bunch of uh, Baptist followers decided to jump ship and become Christians. Same deal here, I, I think. That's my suspicion anyway. Originally, there was a group that said, Paul was crucified for you, etc. Paul was the one who defeated the evil archons and so on. And therefore, I am of Paul. Uh, and there was a, uh, and you can see how that would follow from this. Paul is martyred and rises from the dead. He gives a, a sermon on the mount, right? There's a set of beatitudes. It's like the same kind of stuff is told of him. Peter, well, we're not getting into the acts of Peter, but already in the canonical acts, we had a passion and sort of resurrection narrative uh, that looks point for point like that of Jesus uh, and uh, in the Gospel of Luke. And, uh, and then after his resurrection appearance to the household of uh, John Mark's mother, he then uh, says farewell and leaves and, and puts James the Just in charge, very much like Jesus being crucified, appearing to his disciples, ascending and leaving Pete in charge. And uh, with Apollos, uh, everybody that knew about him knew how closely paralleled his uh, legendary career was to Jesus in so many ways. And uh, and I'm guessing Apollos may have been Apollonius. Uh, so uh, yeah, that would make some sense how that uh, all four of them were quite analogous, that that was sort of the typical hagiography of one of the cult saviors, but eventually as they began to lose ground and to shrink, they decided, well, why not merge with these other guys? We're a lot like them. We can venerate both their figurehead and ours. Why not? And eventually the Jesus group proved to be the, uh, the one with the most staying power. And so the original figureheads of the other groups became subordinates to Jesus in one way or another. At least that's my story and I'm sticking to it, as they say. Well, what say? Oh, and, and also got to point out, what is the evidence that Paul died in the Neronian persecution? You just heard it. 
Uh, I don't think there is any real evidence about when Paul died or how, because if this is what you're banking on, forget it. You know, uh, he might as well have died in the war in Vietnam as this, right? Uh, uh, so uh, there's a lot that's taken for granted. Uh, if you have no real evidence and what you do have is kind of silly, you just say, well, we don't know any better than that, so we can assume that's true. <laughs> no, no, you can't. Okay, uh, let's see here. Okay. What uh, interesting questions have we? Mm, Richard says, could the baptizing of the lion be a prophecy of the Christianizing of the Roman Empire? That is really interesting. I wouldn't be surprised. Of course, uh, it hadn't been Christianized in the second century when this is generally believed to have been written. But who the heck knows? Uh, you may be right. That is fascinating. Never thought of that. Thanks. Um, uh, Mark uh, Weatherhill uh, says, uh, just as an aside, I reckon most of us here in the UK know who on earth Paul Lind was, but would recognize the voice from, <laughs> from Penelope Pit Stop cartoons. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I tell you. You see? Uh, pop culture, cartoons, comics are very important for understanding the New Testament. And, and here is further proof. Bravo. That's great. Uh, uh, let's see. Well, well, that's all the questions we have. I understand that the Acts of Paul, you might think it would uh, yield a lot more questions because it's less familiar. But on the other hand, a lot of it is uh, just prolix, windy, uh, apostolic fan fiction. Uh, but um, I, I, once again, I recommend a terrific book by Dennis McDonald called The Legend and the Apostle, uh, The Battle for Paul in Story and Canon, where he goes into the acts of Paul as one uh, side of a Paulinist debate and the pastoral epistles as the, the propaganda for the other side pro and anti encretism and so forth. Really, really illuminating book. Great stuff. And um, I should just inform you, speaking of fan fiction, um, I won't be doing the usual Bible geek on, uh, on uh, Friday evening, but I have pre-recorded an article dealing with something that came up on a past uh, by based on observations that occurred to me while we were discussing uh, uh, certain things on the Bible Geek. Similarly, Saturday at four, the uh, Gnostic Sabbath will be a pre-recorded thing. Uh, I uh, just uh, recorded that with Bishop Taylor earlier today. And that is a story that I wrote based on Richard Tierney's um, fictionalized version of Simon Magus as a sword and sorcery hero. He wrote a couple of terrific novels and a bunch of great short stories back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, he had given up writing uh, just shortly before he passed away. And uh, once I, because I uh, was hoping to get him to do more Simon stories, but he just didn't have the heart for it anymore. But he gave me permission to continue Simon's adventures. So I've written about uh, six of these stories that have been published here and there. And um, uh, this is one of them. It's called The Tomb of the Titan. And it appears in my new uh heroic fantasy anthology, uh, Flashing Swords, number eight. And it's available on Amazon, and it's got that story by me about Simon Magus and Goliath ascending into heaven and fighting the Archons. Oh, boy, it's a thrill a minute. Uh, and I've got a, a, a Thongor short story in there, Thongor on Callisto. 
And then there's uh, about eight other stories by other writers about various well-known heroic fantasy characters. Uh, I'm proud of it. And uh, there you can get it on Amazon, as with the two previous volumes that I edited, uh, six and seven, and what's an unofficial precursor to them, a book called uh, The Mighty uh, Warriors. And it's pretty much the same thing. We just hadn't started calling it Flashing Swords yet. So I think you you might enjoy that if you're a fiction fan. And uh, uh, so uh, I would recommend that to you. By the way, we do have one more question from Daniel Hopkins. Do you know why Paul shaved his head? Presuming it was a tradition, uh, what was the history of that tradition? Well, it was just um, the uh, typical part of the Nazarite vow uh, that you could sign on for for any specified length of time. Uh, and uh, it could be weeks, months, years, whatever, as long as you were willing to stick it out. And in that time, you had certain restrictions. You could not touch uh, a wounded or dead body, uh, any running uh, blood or, or a, a other uh, discharge of the body. Uh, it would render you ritually unclean. Again, there was no immorality attached to it. It was just ceremonial purity. You also couldn't drink wine or strong drink during that time. And I think there was a celibacy requirement, as I remember. But the relevant one here is you couldn't cut your hair during that period. So people would shave their heads before, uh, well, as it started. Uh, and uh, then for the duration, they would not trim it. But after it was over, and it was longer than usual because in these cultures, men had short hair. Um, then you would have it cut again. And so Paul is uh, having his head shaved to finish his Nazarite uh, period of dedication. So there's nothing all that weird about it. Uh, and, uh, and that's what the other guys were doing, the other brethren in Jerusalem. Paul, he, he pays for their... Uh, barber visit and all that stuff too just to prove that he is a torah observant jew not some kind of libertine telling the jewish converts to jesus to forget the torah oh no he wouldn't do that right yeah so anyway that's what that's about okay i'm gonna get going my voice is a little on the scratchy side from having read that story and doing this but i will indeed uh, be rested up and ready to go at six uh, for the bible geek tonight and i expect to see you then right in the front row so goodbye Thank you.